Okay, can we hear me? Hi, everybody. So we are about to get started, and the people who don't have seats could decoratively line up here in the front if you wanted to do that. I think that is compatible with fire regulations if you sit here or somewhere. All right, so this uh, event is organized by the Global Justice Program, which is a Yale institution within the Macmillan Center, and you can find out more about it on its website if you want to, and join it and participate in its future activities. But we are here now to listen to Jeff Sachs, and so I will introduce him and then turn it over to him. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs is a world-famous professor of economics, leader in sustainable development, senior UN advisor, best-selling author, and a syndicated columnist whose monthly essays appear in over 100 countries. He has twice been named among Time Magazine's 100 most influential world leaders, and the New York Times has called him probably, stingy formulation, the most important economist in the world. And Time Magazine calls him the world's best known economist. He's received 20 or over 20 honorary degrees. Professor Sachs directs the Mighty Earth Institute at Columbia University. He has been serving as special advisor on the Millennium Development Goals to UN Secretaries General Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon. He's director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and of the Millennium Villages Project, as well as co-founder and chief strategist for the Millennium Promise Alliance. He has authored three New York Times bestsellers in the past seven years, and his most recent book, not yet a bestseller, is To Move the World, JFK's Quest for Peace. Welcome, Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you. <laughs> Thomas, th thanks a lot. If people could come in uh, to make yourselves uh, more comfortable, that would be good. I can tell you, uh, I once stood in a line exactly like that. It was uh, a while ago, but I talked to the person next to me who was a stranger, and it, she's been my wife for uh, <laughs> 30, 34 years now. Uh, so meet the person next to you, <laughs> get to know each other, uh, but uh, do come in, uh, make yourselves uh, at home if you can. Thomas, thank you very much for organizing this timely discussion today about the global development agenda. And I want to give a report uh, to you of where things are at the United Nations right now, uh, because that is the locus of negotiating activity on the post-2015 agenda. And I think it's a very important agenda, very important to get right. And for all of you, uh, young leaders in sustainable development here, this will be your agenda, so it's really worth getting right because this will be as best as there can be uh, a set of global ideas and perspectives on how to move forward uh, for the whole world, for the 193 UN member states on sustainable development. I think it's a kind of last chance for some of the things that we really want to accomplish in the world, uh, especially around climate change. Now, it's really unfair to have a blizzard when I'm going to talk about climate change. But, uh, but, but we do know that uh, instability of the weather system is part of what uh, we can expect. And as uh, weird as the weather has been in the Northeast, it's also been weirdly warm in uh, in uh, the West, and it's been very warm in Europe because I left the last New York blizzard and flew to a very balmy uh, Paris where it was about 55 degrees uh, in uh, the middle of January, and there is a lot of instability. Now, that digression is because part of the goal of this 2015 negotiation is to incorporate the climate issues into the global development agenda more adequately. And there really is very good reason to believe that we are just about out of time to meet objectives that were set 21 years ago, 22 years ago uh, now, uh, at uh, the Earth Summit 
when the governments agreed to take actions to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. And after they did that and then did nothing for many years, they set a definition which is already a slippage, but a definition that two degrees centigrade threshold was the limit to avoid really dangerous anthropogenic interference. Uh, and we're just at the verge of losing that target right now. This is probably the end, except, of course, if there are some magnificent technological breakthroughs that sweep the planet a lot faster than we might expect. Otherwise, we really are seeing the two degree centigrade slip away, and this is the last chance. It's kind of the last uh, hold that we have uh, before we lose that entirely. So the backdrop of these negotiations, uh, you could start uh, probably 42 years ago in Stockholm at the first uh, UN uh, summit on uh, environment and development, uh, the first uh, UN conference on environment and development, which was really the first time that the world as global political community said that there was a challenge of uh, combining economic development and environmental uh, sustainability. And I count 1972 as a very important year for this for three reasons. That conference uh, was one of them. Second, that's when Limits to Growth was published, uh, which really was a very important book. And the third m most important event of that year from my perspective is that's when I started studying economics. And the first book that I was assigned actually in Act 10 uh, at Harvard was Limits to Growth. But I was assigned it so that the professors could say, this is a bunch of junk. Uh, this has nothing right. By the way, it was written by uh, people down at MIT. So that's what I was told. So naturally they got it wrong. Uh, and they got it wrong because they didn't have prices in it and it wasn't a proper economic model and so forth. Well, now we're 40 years later and a lot of what limits to growth said actually is correct, uh, even in its time perspective. Not that we've had the collapse of uh, the world economy as that book said was possible, but that we will have put pressures on ecosystems to such an extraordinary extent that we are endangering the future. So 20 years after the Stockholm conference came the Rio Earth Summit. That was also an important watershed for humanity. Three wonderful treaties were signed in 1992. Very important international law. They remain the cornerstone of international environmental agreements. Most importantly is the Framework Convention on Climate Change which set the goal of avoiding dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. Second was the Convention on Biological Diversity. And third was the much less known but applicable to the world's most desperate people, Convention to Combat Desertification, uh, the UNCCD. So three major multilateral environmental agreements were signed in 1992. And to remind you of how weird the United States has gotten in such a short period of time. We had a Republican president of the United States go to Rio in 1992, uh, President George H. W. Walker Bush Sr., and signed the three treaties. Now you can't even drag a Democratic president to go to a conference much less sign a treaty. All of American diplomacy now behind the scenes is don't make it a treaty because uh, everybody believes that nothing can possibly be done by the American political system anymore. So those three treaties were signed. The US ratified the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, it did also ratify the Convention on uh, combating desertification, though it was never heard of again. And uh, Newt Gingrich, that uh, wonderful uh, paragon of uh, civic virtue, uh, uh, convinced uh, the American uh, 
uh, America's representatives uh, in, in the Senate that freedom uh, in America and property rights meant the freedom to destroy species so that we should not uh, engage in the Convention on Biological Diversity. And America never signed uh, the CBD uh, until today, so we are not party to it. Uh, well, the real story that is the drama for all of us is that none of those treaties has worked. We have international law, not one of them has been implemented. Uh, and this is staggering because we don't have a lot of fallback positions. And these are not a joke. These are real and they are actually well drafted treaties and they're quite compelling and a lot of effort went into make them and to ratify them. And we spend a lot of time uh, on discussing them actually. In Warsaw this uh, past uh, December was the 19th conference of the parties under the UN Framework Convention. There is one every year and there's a very important one potentially coming up next year which will be the COP21 in Paris in December 2015. But I found it quite stunning when the 40th anniversary of Stockholm came and the 20th anniversary of the Rio Earth Summit came, the UN hosted another meeting in Rio once again, the Rio Plus 20 Summit to review what had happened. And Nature Magazine wrote a very good overview of the three treaties which is really worth going back and reading. It was a report card on the three treaties. It was not the kind of report card you would like. Uh, it was uh, three Fs uh, on implementing the treaties and quite soundly uh, put that not one of them has been able to produce an outcome. That's really our situation, which is that the juggernaut of the world economy has not stopped to take a breather on climate change, on destruction of species, uh, or on desperately degraded lands in desperately poor and vulnerable places, which is what the desertification treaty applies to. We've had a lot of economic growth since uh, 1972, Stockholm, uh, and again since 1992, the world is enjoying uh, a an economic uh, boom at global scale, though we have our own economic crisis, the world economy continues to grow at about 4% per year. And that means a doubling time of roughly 17 and a half years. So the world economy continues to develop. There have been real economic miracles in some parts of the world, most importantly in East Asia and most notably in China, which has grown uh, about uh, 30 times in magnitude since 1978 when Deng Xiaoping first came to power. We don't lack for technological means. There have been tremendous breakthroughs in uh, renewable energy of various kinds, and probably most notably in the fall of uh, photovoltaic prices from uh, 100, well, about $70 a watt uh, in uh, 1977. Uh, when this was still an exotic technology that was used on space missions but nothing very practical to about 70 cents a watt now uh, because of the learning curve and certainly the massive entry of China into uh, PV production. But with all of those advances, the underlying dynamics of a global market economy which is very effective in certain ways, especially in growing, uh, has continued. And not only have we not seen these treaties change the curve on crucial dynamics in climate, most importantly on greenhouse gas emissions and on CBD, the biodiversity treaty, on the loss of species abundance and the extinction of species and the loss of habitat, not only have we not shifted the needle, it's gone in the other direction basically. We are on an accelerating path of environmental 
destruction. Not surprisingly, because the finite planet is being faced with the continuing growth of the world economy in ways that are still heavily resource using and have not really been able to shift direction. So that was the context of what was a kind of somber Rio Plus 20 summit in June 2012. And the conferees did one important thing. I think it's kind of, I view it as kind of the last branch that you're grasping at the edge of the, the cliff. They took a look at this landscape of ineffective international law, and they compared it with something that was not fully hopeful by any means, but a little bit more hopeful. Uh, and that was the global response to fighting poverty under the Millennium Development Goals. I don't want to oversell a miracle by any means, because there is no miracle, but there has been progress surprising progress since the year 2000 on fighting poverty and on drawing global attention to the problems of extreme poverty. And the Millennium Development Goals, unlike the Rio Earth Summit Agenda 21, for example, somehow kept a, a life in public consciousness. They're still talked about 14 years later, which is very rare for a UN activity other than in highly technical circles. And so the conferees said, you know, maybe what we need are global goals that could help to motivate the public. And in the closing document of the Rio Plus 20 Summit, a document called The Future We Want, which is also a good document and, and worth reading, it says that the world should adopt a small number of highly visible motivational goals to help motivate the world to change direction to achieve sustainable development. That, I think, is our last handhold on this cliff. And the Rio Plus 20 Summit called on the UN General Assembly to put in motion a process of negotiation to arrive at a set of Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And that is what is being negotiated right now. Specifically, an open working group, so-called, to represent the UN General Assembly was set up to start negotiating what these goals can be. And then this past November, I'm sorry, this past September, September 25th, a decision of the General Assembly was taken that this open working group, which is kind of an open expert consultative process, should report, finish its work no later than this fall. The Secretary General should then make a set of recommendations to the General Assembly by the beginning of 2015. And at the end of that General Assembly process, which will conclude in September 2015, the world leaders should adopt a new post-2015 development agenda. And so the idea has taken shape that the Millennium Development Goal period will come to an end and then be followed by a sustainable development goal period. And this I find hopeful because we got to have hope, and there aren't too many tools that we have. Now, my experience with the MDGs is that they have made a difference. They've made a difference in public awareness, in mobilizing expert communities in key areas like the control of AIDS or the control of malaria or safe childbirth or other of the MDGs, and they have held poor country governments somewhat accountable for the performance on fighting poverty. And that's the basic idea of global goals and the basic idea of the sustainable development goals. What's useful, I think, is that for these new goals, if they are achieved, actually, if they're agreed by September 2015, these are to be universal. They're not meant to be 
for poor countries alone. They're meant to take the sustainable development agenda as a universal agenda, presumably for the period 2015 to 2030, presumably a succinct number of goals that can encapsulate the world's priority needs on sustainable development. So what does that mean? Sustainable development as a concept is also something I think is quite important and evolving. It was first put on the global agenda in 1987 by Gru Harlem Brundtland when she was Prime Minister of Norway and chaired the Global Commission that put sustainable development as a global objective that was adopted at the Rio Earth Summit. And when sustainable development was first put forward, it was put forward as a kind of intertemporal concept that the current generation should meet its needs in a way that will allow future generations to meet their needs. And that became the classic definition of sustainable development. It wasn't an easy one to implement, I must say. Of course, it had an element of truth to it, but it was very squishy. And it wasn't easy exactly to get one's hands on. And so the concept itself of sustainable development has evolved to something quite different that also is in agreement with that earlier concept, but is really a little bit different uh, vantage point that I find more useful. Because at the Rio Plus 20 Summit, what the government said is sustainable development means a holistic approach to integrate economic, social, and environmental objectives of society. So now, instead of being defined mainly across time, it's defined across uh, objectives of society. And so the idea is to take a holistic approach to society's needs that integrate economic development, including ending poverty, social development or social well-being, including concepts like social capital, trust, good governance, equality, gender rights, human rights, and so forth, and environmental sustainability, defined broadly, but certainly including fighting climate change, fighting the loss of biodiversity, and conserving the vital functions of ecosystems. And so it's mostly in that three-dimensional viewpoint that these new SDGs are being negotiated right now. Where things stand is to be, uh, try to be succinct about what is a sprawling set of negotiations right now. There have been about 200 goals proposed, but there's a kind of consensus that's boiling down to something under a dozen goals. And there is also a meta consensus that the SDG should have probably no more than 10 goals so that you can do this uh, and count them. The idea is not to make uh, a wiki SDG and not to make a compendium of sustainable development, but actually to have something that's motivational, operational, uh, that can be used for public advocacy, mobilization, problem solving, accountability, so that sustainable development will become a social movement, not a technocratic exercise. Though we need the technocracy too. These are very complicated objectives to meet. So there's pretty good agreement on a number of the goals. Almost everybody agrees that SDG 1 is ending extreme poverty. So this is to finish the work of the Millennium Development Goals. The proportion of global households living under the proverbial $1.25 a day World Bank threshold has come down from about 44% in 1990 to somewhere probably around 18% today. We're still four years late for getting the next round of World Bank data, which is itself part of what needs to be corrected in the next round because unfortunately, uh, Google and the NSA certainly collect in one day 
thousands of times more data than the World Bank collects in four years. And this can't go on any longer than that. One way to correct it would be to close down the NSA, by the way, which would be the, the optimal approach. Um, but let me not digress. Uh, we, could, we could take that up uh, in, a, in, another, uh, in another venue. So we need timely data, but SDG number one would be the timely end of extreme poverty, essentially finishing the Millennium Development Goals. Then there is a pretty broad consensus on a range of other headline objectives. Uh, certainly there are objectives around broad economic development. Poor countries want to make sure that nothing that is done is closing the door to them in convergence to, with the high income world, whether it's convergence, of course, with the high income world changing how we live, the idea is not to make a permanent economic caste system where, okay, we stop development, but rather to ensure the continuing possibility of economic development in the poor countries. So that's a kind of goal number two. There's consensus that human rights, social inclusion, measures of inequality have to be part of the new SDGs. And there's debate, of course, how that should be done. There's pretty much consensus that there should be an overarching goal on health. The MDGs had three health goals, child survival, maternal survival, and the control of the major epidemic diseases. The idea is to integrate those into some kind of universal health coverage, universal access, and also incorporating a universal healthy uh, living. So it's not only purely within the health system, but an overarching health goal. There's a consensus that there needs to be an overarching education goal also. In the Millennium Development Goals, goal number uh, two is uh, universal uh, access to uh, primary education, uh, and I think that in the SDGs it will be something like universal secondary education as a minimum standard, uh, and there's more or less consensus around something like that. There is then, and then there's finally consensus on some kind of global governance goal. How to define it, not clear, but good governance for sustainable development. In the Millennium Development Goals, MDG 8 is a, about global partnership, and it's, say, if there are 10 of these goals, SDG 10 would be something around good global governance for sustainable development. And there is a strong intention to include corporate governance within that definition. So it's not only the political system, but it is all major companies having responsibilities to abide by the standards of sustainable development as well. Very healthy and I think very interesting development. So I probably named about seven uh, of what ostensibly will be something like 10 SDGs. Then the controversies rage about the remainder. How to slice and dice them, uh, what should be in, what should be out, and so forth. So I'll just give you a, uh, just a couple of minutes of my own highly biased views on, on this, because you may be surprised to know I have strong views about all of them. Uh, and uh, now I believe, for example, that without question there should be a goal on climate change. To my, to my mind, it's a no-brainer. Uh, but there is a kind of move that says, well, we shouldn't have climate change here because we have it under the framework convention. Uh, and so let's have maybe something about energy for all here, but have climate handled elsewhere in the system. This is just a matter of complication of intergovernmental negotiations because governments do not want to commit in the SDG process to something that they're not committed to in that real juridical process. But from my point of view, I'm trying 
to emphasize that the SDGs are not a technical list, they are a narrative of global need. So you can't leave climate change off, that's the whole story, darn it. You can't, how could you have sustainable development goals and not have that as part of the narrative? So I'm trying to argue in the UN with the governments that this is about a narrative, this is about a vision for the world of an integrated view of development. It's not about the technical uh, scorecard of this one here, that one there, but the SDG should stand as a vision. Well, there's some agreement on that and there's some com uh, conf confusion and that's also not how diplomats think uh, and how governments think. Governments do not think in terms of social mobilization, public movements, advocacy, narratives. Uh, they think in terms of what's gonna be convenient or inconvenient for them, where the boxes uh, are ticked and so forth. I believe in the end it's almost unimaginable for there to be SDGs without a climate goal because it would be an incoherent document even if one would have a footnote that says that is covered someplace else. So I believe that one of these goals will be something like control of uh, climate change and uh, access, universal access to sustainable energy or something like that that will combine a, a climate and an energy goal. Then I'm and my number of colleagues uh, in a process that I'm uh, also managing for Secretary General are advocating a, an urban sustainability goal. And the idea there is just plainly a political mobilization idea and an organizational idea. And that is that every city in the world needs to have sustainability planning as an analytical and operational and organizational uh, construct. New York City has made volumes on, uh, of uh, what's called Plan YC under, uh, under Mayor Bloomberg. Very important work. Uh, it would be even better if they actually implemented some of it. Uh, we had at the Earth Institute uh, one wonderful urban uh, engineer who for 10 years was saying, we're gonna flood, we're gonna flood, we're gonna flood. Couldn't get attention. He predicted exactly, of course, because he had good topographical maps, where Sandy would flood the city, how it would happen. And this man who had been petitioning his own uh, district to allow him to protect his house, his house was washed away because uh, he was uh, in uh, the Hudson Valley and not washed away but massively flooded. Very sad, we can talk a lot, we at least need to have the plans and then to implement them. And so the idea is for an urban sustainability goal, or that's our idea, there are a few thousand major cities around the world that are of a scale that they should be carrying out this kind of activity and I think having this in the SDGs would be a strong organizing principle. There is need obviously for some kind of goals around ecosystems and biodiversity conservation. And there are lots of ideas about how to do that because there's a lot there. There's species survival, there's ecosystem functions, there's critical biomes, there's forests, there's oceans, uh, there's habitat, uh, and uh, there's a strong push for a water goal, which is understandable, but also complicated uh, of how it cross cuts uh, these other areas. But something around biodiversity uh, is, uh, is extremely important. So somehow this process has to converge in what is likely to be a three tier goals, targets, and indicators. And this is a discussion that will take place with, I think, plenty of opportunity for inputs and for advocacy between now and probably the middle of 2015. There are two other things that are going on that intersect this of critical importance. This is also almost exactly the period 
in which the world is trying to negotiate a new climate agreement to replace the broken Kyoto Protocol, which never properly functioned. And so we've had the Kyoto Protocol, of which the U.S. did not become a party. It also did not include binding uh, constraints on the developing countries, which by now are half of the world's emissions and will be much more than half of the world's emissions soon. The future will be made in what are today's developing countries to a crucial extent. But their making it will depend on how the high income countries act. If they act abusively as they have until now, that's one thing. If they act responsibly, there is still at least a slim chance that the world takes more decisive action. The goal on climate is to reach agreement in December 2015 at the COP21 and then, believe it or not, three years process to ratify the treaty and real implementation beginning at the start of 2020. Thank God this is not an important issue. Uh, we, we've got plenty of time uh, and uh, this can go on, it seems, forever. It's and it's extraordinarily, this is the hardest issue, period. And we should talk about that in, in the discussion, uh, some, of, some of the thoughts on that. But we are so far off course, it ain't even close. And there are glimmers of hope, and technically it's possible, technically, to keep below the two degrees C in a growing world economy. Of course, you could in a collapse, if you told the developing countries no more progress for you or massive collapse of living standards in rich countries, then you could keep below the target. But the harder goal is to achieve economic progress broadly in a way that is consistent with climate sustainability. And of course, the essence of that is to decarbonize the energy system. And that is a major challenge because the energy system is at the heart of the economic system. And we've now had 200 years of growing in the context of a fossil fuel-based world economy. So everything we do is based on fossil fuels. And changing that in a way that is timely with the natural carbon budget is just at the edge of feasibility. It's not gone yet, but it would take decisive decisions next year at the latest. That's why something like the Keystone Pipeline is so crucial. Uh, it is not a side issue, it's a central issue. It's a decision whether we will just produce every bit of unconventional hydrocarbon that you can find anywhere, because if you decide to do that, then there is no limit at all. And it's quite fascinating what's going to happen, so let's discuss that as well. So that's one piece of the negotiation that is intersecting with all of this. The other is a general question of the overall means of organizing uh, the international system in terms of finances, in terms of the question of aid, which I'll discuss tonight at, uh, at the Yale Political Union, uh, the question of other means of implementation. And there, there are huge debates, not surprisingly. The rich countries say, we're poor. The poor countries say, yeah, you're poor? Tell us about it. How about us? Uh, and the poorest countries say, we're dying. Uh, and we're suffering all of the shocks that have been imposed upon us by the already uh, far along process of climate change and other instability. The world is not a happy, trusting place. It's interesting that Secretary Kerry gave a very strong climate speech in Jakarta yesterday. In a way, puzzling, because that would be a great speech for Washington, not for Jakarta, maybe promising because it would take a lot of chutzpah to give it in Jakarta, but not have it mean something in Washington. But there is no evidence that it means anything in Washington right now. And so this is why there's a lot of distrust 
a lot of confusion. What are you really telling us to do? What are you going to do? There's been a lot of cynicism. Some of you may recall that at the penultimate moment of the failed Copenhagen uh, negotiation on climate, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton rushed in and said, we promise $100 billion by 2020 to developing countries. Turns out that in trying to understand what that is, the reality is somewhere between 100 billion and 0, 0.0. And so there's a lot of distrust. Is there anything real? Is, are you going to help finance this? What are the shared responsibilities? There will probably be a conference next year in the middle of all of this conferencing and negotiating on financing for development, which is a reprise of a, an important meeting that took place in Monterey, Mexico 10 years ago on financing for development that made a lot of promises that remained unfulfilled. So I'll pause here to open the discussion to say this is a very filled moment of global diplomacy. It is quite possible uh, if you take a purely observer's point of view to say what difference could this possibly make? You know, multilateralism doesn't work, there's no leadership, doesn't matter what you agree, it's all words. That's not necessarily a wrong point of view. I would just tell you that there's no other stopgap behind it, though. The reason I find these processes important is not that they are by any means sure successes. I just don't see anything behind it. If we lose the concept of multilateralism, if we can't arrive at shared goals, how are we going to fix the planet? Thanks very much. Okay. Oh, yeah.